Thank you. Um, so welcome everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Judy Kitt. I'm the president of the Foundation for Mind Being Research. Um, if you don't know about us, I know there might be a couple people who don't know about us. Um, we were founded in 1980, 44 years ago, by scientists and um, alternative healers and artists who are interested in the nature of consciousness. And um, so for 44 years, we've been kind of doing stuff like this. We've been a platform for people who are doing work in this field, in this uh, in this area, to come and present their work and have really good discussions about it and um, learn from them. It's, it's really just wonderful. It's one of the most exciting things um, I think there is. Our website is fmbr.org, and we have a YouTube channel, which is uh, FMBR TV on YouTube. If you search that, and then all of our um, all of our presentations and talks can be found there. So check us out there. Um, I'm very excited th this evening to welcome Roberto Miller, who is an award-winning filmmaker who studied creative writing at Stanford University while producing multimedia projects there. He made the first all digital film, Male Bonding, M A I L Bonding, which screened at festivals worldwide, won awards, and was featured in American, uh, um, in American Cinematographer. Directed and produced TV commercials for Hewlett Packard and Apple before returning to narrative filmmaking with the award winning feature film Mandorla, which is where I first met you. Um, recently, he completed a documentary, which we will be watching, The Four Lives of Federico Fagin, and is developing a series. Back to the Garden. Born in New Orleans with roots in Central America and France, he is hanging out right now in Mountain View, California. And welcome, Roberto. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too, Judy. Uh, good to be back in Mountain View. And uh, my assistant editor and uh, art director is uh, Liz Miller, just off camera here, right there. Hi, Liz. Right. <laughs> she will keep me on track, hopefully, along with Judy. Um, you know, I believe Federico was part of the FMBR group going back decades. He's, he's actually a member. He's actually a member of FMBR, or has been, and he has supported us. Um, longtime friend. Yeah, very good. Uh, exciting to be here. Exciting to show this for Federico. He would love to be here tonight. Um, but the ambassador um, of uh, of Italy to the United States, wanted to meet Federico, and uh, today was the day. So it happened to just a few days ago, up him off, but he sends his best in regards and uh, wants to know what people uh, think of the film and any questions that can be answered. Um, I've heard him answer a few questions as we've screened this uh, film around the world. Um, we did it at the Beyond the Brain conference in, in London. Um, the Silmar Microcomputer Conference at Silmar, uh, also in uh, Italy at the Paris Center, um, which was a, a great uh, screening as well. Um, I can tell you why I had to make this film, if you like. Uh, well, I uh, went to a, uh, Liz and I went to a conference on consciousness in 2017, I think. Um, it was uh, put on by the uh, IAC, International Academy of Consciousness, and Federico was on a panel there, and uh, he was just saying things uh, with full vigor about uh, how physics should not be based on materialism, and uh, how consciousness is the fundamental nature of reality, and I was just thinking, this guy needs to be on camera. And then within 24 hours, three other people independently suggested to me that I should make a documentary about Federico. And so I got the message and approached Federico there. And they said, let's have lunch when we get back to California. And we did, and just uh, started a very good conversation. He then gave me an advanced copy of his autobiography, which is uh, called uh, Silicon. And uh, the subtitle of that is From the Invention of the Microprocessor to the New Science of Consciousness. So I read that um, in a galley form, so to speak. And I thought, I'm going to pull some questions out of here and take my gear out to his, to his house and uh, do an interview. And that's what you're going to see, because it was just magic. 
he was ready to tell this story on camera, very alive, very deeply uh, feeling everything. And uh, I think he has a lot of important things to share. It's his mission. Um, and he's standing on some incredible accomplishments uh, from the technology he's invented, uh, microprocessors, touch screen, touchpad, the things we use every day, um, to deep thinking about artificial intelligence, which he was a pioneer of 30 years ago, um, to just the nature of reality. And quietly did that here in Silicon Valley for 20 some years. And finally, he is fully ready to come out and say what he thinks about all of this. And he's rattling some good cages about it. That's excellent. And he's he's written a book recently um, called Irreducible, I think you said? That's correct. It's, it's a, being translated. Correct. It's a, a big hit in Italy. It's into its third or fourth printing already in within a year uh, in Italy, over 50,000 copies sold. And it's like irreducible is, um, you know, the fundamental nature of consciousness. Um, and he, he just did a, a 200 stop tour in Italy and he just got back to the US. Uh, he is a big thing in Italy. And uh, and I really hope he gets more exposure here in the US. He believe, I believe he said when we saw him last that it will be coming out in April of next year That's and he, i'm sure he'd be happy to be come to fmbr and uh, that would be wonderful to have him come and and talk about his book great yeah. okay so we are gonna we're gonna show this documentary it is uh 30 minutes long and then uh when we come back you can um take notes write questions and um i'm there looks like we have a question already carol i'm gonna unmute you or let me see Carol, do you have a question? Let me see. You can unmute yourself, uh, Carol, if you have a question. Uh, I just signed in and I think in just checking to be sure my video was off and everything. I think I just bumped it. I am sorry. Oh, I see. Okay. That's, I, <laughs> I, I, I thought that was probably happening, but okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So. Why don't you go ahead and uh, set up the film? So um, we will talk about this after the film. And then um, also Roberto will be telling us about his his upcoming plans for a new series, which is really exciting. So um, take it away. Okay. And Federico's going to be in the new film too. We'll tell you more about that in a minute. All right. And try to share the screen. Select the one with the movie. screen up there. Everybody see that okay? Yep, it looks great. Okay, good. Let's go back. Just start here. We rarely appreciate the different interests that has led each of us to where we are. The different lives that each one of us has led until they all come together born in wartime, studying machines and making them. A degree in physics, then inventing technology the world has used for over 50 years. Roberto, I think when you muted, we can't hear the, we can't hear the film anymore. These are the four lives of Federico Fagin. My name is Federico Fagin. I was born in Vicenza, Italy. And uh, it was war, 1941. After a year and a half, my family moved to the countryside. Isola Vicentina is the small town, actually a village. They were interesting years because I lived in the countryside like people lived centuries before. 
um, farmers still use oxen drawn carts and plows and many homes didn't have electricity in the, in the countryside not where we live but in the countryside and uh no running water it was a well exactly like people lived two centuries ago so i'm fortunate in a sense because i experienced the agricultural era the industrial era and i helped build the information era <laughs> Well, as I was growing up, the um, my interest was clearly moving toward machines, especially airplanes. I love airplanes. I mean, I couldn't understand how they could fly, but but uh, they were something special. And uh, but any kind of machine, automobiles, uh, trucks, you name it motorcycles and uh, I wanted to understand how they worked and to me the the interesting part was that machines I could understand people was harder <laughs> they're not as predictable as machines I was hired when I was 18 but almost 19. I spent about a year and, and three months designing and building a small experimental computer using transistors. This was 1960, 1961. The entire 1961 was spent in doing this. And it worked at the end. And uh, I essentially designed about 60% of it. Um, and I had four technicians working for me. And then I decided to go back to school and uh, go to the University of Padua, where I studied physics, because I wanted to understand more deeply how transistors work. It was clear transistors were just in the beginning of their ascendance. Uh, so for me, it was important to understand how they really worked. And uh, that's why I chose physics. I wanted to understand the solid state physics that was based on quantum physics. that was essential to their operation. And I have to say that without that experience, I could not have designed the microprocessor eight years later. The way I arrived to the U.S. is actually uh, simple because I worked for a company called uh, SGS Fairchild that was partly owned by Fairchild Semiconductor, which was the foundational company of the microelectronics here in Silicon Valley. So after I developed the MOS process technology for SGS Virtual, uh, I was asked to come to the U.S. for a period of six months, which is still going on. <laughs> and it was here uh, in 1968 where I developed the Silicon Gate technology which was the foundational technology of pretty much all the microelectronics that follow for the next 40, 50 years. The microprocessor was one of those inventions whose time would have come no matter what. Because the computer existed, the integrated circuit existed, what did not exist yet was a technology powerful enough to make it at that particular time in history. And I happened to be the one at that time that had developed the technology that made it possible. And I was also capable of doing the design that was required with that technology to make it possible. And also, Nobody had put so many transistors in a single chip like it was required to make a CPU on a chip, which was the microprocessor. And there was not a methodology yet to do it with silicon gate, which was the new, the new technology. So I developed the methodology and also I developed all the circuits to do the microprocessor. And so and I had to do that in record time because it was a custom project for a Japanese customer. And Intel was late because they had 
nobody at Intel had the knowledge to do it at that time. So he will, he had to come together in a <laughs> with in the hardest of circumstances, but I must say that that's exactly what I wanted to do. My major contribution before was the development of the silicon gate technology, but I wanted to do the most complicated design possible with that technology to show that that technology was the winning technology, which eventually became the winning technology. So, so that microprocessor for me was a, a show of what you could do with the silicon gate. And of course, making a CPU in a chip, which was considered something already in the future, was bringing the future in the present. The time that the microprocessor was born was uh, in uh, January. I forgot the date that they now mark it down anywhere, but it was somewhere in January, mid-January of 1971. And uh, I received the run with the wafers of the, uh, that contained many chips. And uh, I set myself for a night of work because uh, that was the only way to do it in a, in without showing my nervousness. <laughs> and um, and as I was probing, everything seemed to work. And uh, so I stay up until 4 a.m. And then I went home. Uh, and uh, Elvia was waiting for me. She she you know had, she was uh, asleep a little bit, but as soon as she heard me, she said, "What happened?" And I said, it works. <laughs> and so that was a wonderful, wonderful celebration. You know, we embraced and, and it was really a way to, uh, you know, to, we actually both understood that at that time, something momentous had happened, that, that that was the beginning of a new way of doing things. Because later on, uh, I was the one to push Intel to actually sell the microprocessor to everybody because it was a custom project originally. So, so I put a lot of uh, energy to convince them that they should go out and sell it, make it a, a general product. Um, and so that, that also was part of my contribution to understand that that was a way, the way of the future, not just another chip, uh, difficult as it was. So, to me, the microprocessor was the, the beginning of a journey in microprocessor land because I spent um, um, almost 10 years of my life developing different type, four generations, in fact, under my watch. The 4004, the 8008 was the first 8-bit microprocessor, the 8080, which was the first second generation microprocessor at Intel, and then a Zilog, the Z80, that became a bestseller and is still in volume production today. Uh, and it was in the market in 1976. And the 8000, Z8000, which was the first 16, 32 bit microprocessor, fourth generation microprocessor. So, so, and then after that, I decided that's enough for my, my life about microprocessors, better do something else. <laughs> Uh, what gave me the energy to go out and create my own company was in fact uh, the slowness that I felt at Intel to move aggressively into the microprocessor market. And I, sa I said, that's it. And of course, being in Silicon Valley, right? Uh, you are not man if you don't start your own company. So. <laughs> that was that was the clinch. And so there you go. I try my luck. Well, Zilog was actually, I would say, intoxicating. Um of course, the Z80 became a bestseller. It's still in volume production today, more than 40 years after its introduction. Uh, it was intoxicating because the growth was so fast. 
in three years, we went from 11 people to 1,100. That's when I aged at at least twice the rate at which I aged before. <laughs> Being the CEO of the company was, was not easy to keep up to many parts in motion. And also it was a learning experience. So for me, it was unbelievably rich, but also in many ways frustrating because uh, there were many things that I didn't understand. And so it was, it was a, it was a tough road, but that's where I grew the most. You know, once you start a company, uh, you get addicted to the adrenaline that really uh, pumps <laughs> in your, in your body every, every, every day. Um, and so it's very difficult to give it up. And, uh, so after Zilog, I started a few other companies and, uh, also, it's part of the idea that if you are uh, highly successful, uh, you should be happy. And uh, so I was pursuing that dream as well. Of course, already uh, with the sale uh, of my ownership of Zilog to Exxon Enterprises, I didn't have to work anymore. So I already achieved uh, financial success. I had a wonderful family. And uh, I had several accomplishments. So I was reasonably famous. Uh, and I thought that that should make me happy. A few years later, I found out that I wasn't, that I pretended to be happy. And so that was a actually a, a hard wake up call. It was in fact the beginning of a different direction that took my life because of that. A major enterprise that I started was Synaptics. Uh, Synaptics started with the idea to create neural networks. This is in 1986. I then asked uh, Carver Mead, who was uh, working on uh, neuromorphic sensory chips at Caltech to join and uh, the company took off. And uh, the idea was to create computers that learn. At a time, the entire AI community was thinking that neural networks was a bad idea. Of course, now we all know that uh, they were the structures that saved the day to AI because the last five, 10 years, they have emerged as the only practical solution for problems that could not be solved in any other way. But also we could not solve the problem, not so much because of the hardware, but because we couldn't find an overall architecture, an overarching architecture that would allow with few chips of the same type, analog chips in those cases, we were using emulation of neural networks instead of simulation of neural networks, which is what is done today. And emulation would allow you to have certain characteristics that were much better than what we can do today. However, without an architecture, they would allow to use the same components over and over again, like in a computer. It is impossible, it was impossible to do. So we ended up uh, developing products that we could build at that time. And uh, that's how we invented the touchpad and the touch screen that have changed the way we interface with our mobile devices and that company became highly successful. However, it was in that company that the unhappiness that I felt uh, started to fester. And also in that company, um, I started asking myself, 
since I was studying neuroscience and biology, how come those books never speak about consciousness? They all talk about electrical signals, biochemical signals, and what have you. But consciousness is like a dirty word. It was never mentioned. So I started asking myself, could I make a conscious computer uh, based on the understanding that was prevalent in those days and is still prevalent, that consciousness emerges from the brain and the brain is like a computer. That's the sort of the classical wisdom. And the more I thought, the more impossible the task appear. Uh, it was clear that there was no way that I could produce sensations and feelings, which is the way the consciousness allows us to have an experience by converting electrical signals. How do you do that? Nobody knows. In fact, I realized that the idea that consciousness emerges from the brain because everybody knows that we are made of matter and therefore is the only way that it can possibly come out is simply a wrong idea. I worked very hard on myself trying to understand the nature of consciousness. And it was this intensity of trying to understand, I believe, that attracted an experience that actually changed me forever. That experience was an awakening where I experienced myself as the world that observes itself. That happened spontaneously. It was, you know, it, it was such an unexpected experience that I would never have dreamed that it would be possible. In fact, I, I couldn't even imagine that it would be possible because our ordinary experience is that we are separate from the world. So to experience yourself to be the world that observes itself is a mind twister. And in fact, people cannot understand. I would not have understood at that time what it means had I not experienced it. The only way to understand is to experience it. And that's in fact reveal the essential part of what consciousness is, is the capacity to know through an experience. An experience which is made of feelings, sensations, but brings those feelings and sensations are carriers of meaning. And we get the meaning. That's what knowing is, getting the meaning of something. So we get the meaning of what we are, the meaning of existence, the meaning of things, the meaning of things work and so on. So that was the, this happened 1990. Um, and from that point on, I could never be the same. And then I started, then I understood the consciousness is not what is des described to be. And I started exploring consciousness. And for 20 years, I studied consciousness on my own, living a double life, as they say, but not the way normally people understand double life. So um, still being a CEO of Synaptics, but also spending a fair amount of time working on myself, understanding what it means and so on, studying it, but mostly experiencing. And it was through that process, at the end of that process, that... I realized that consciousness cannot be produced by inert matter, by matter that does not have consciousness as a foundational aspect. Just like electricity and magnetism cannot be produced by atoms and molecules that don't have charge and spin, electrical charge and spin as a foundational property, so is consciousness. So the idea that consciousness can emerge willy-nilly from something that doesn't have any is simply the, you know, just a, a pretext to maintain the mindset that materialism has given us. 
the reception to this idea is uh, you must be crazy. How else can you expect? What else would you expect? I mean, it's, you know, but of course I was crazy even in 1986 to study neural networks and thinking that that was the solution to the problems of artificial intelligence. And it took 25 years to, 20, 25 years to, uh, to actually realize that that was the actual solution. So I, I have a history of being crazy. So I like it. Uh, consciousness is actually what makes us human. Machines don't have consciousness. And based on my studies, they will never have consciousness. Because machines are not living systems. We are used to think the living systems are like machines. Just like we are supposed to be machines. But in fact, they are not. Living systems are quantum systems. And in fact, there are few scientists now studying quantum biology because they have reached the conclusion that a living system that manipulates in itself, manipulates one atom at a time, cannot be a classical system. And that's exactly what's going on. And now is the, there is an awakening the life which nobody understands what it is, by the way, is not a machine like a computer is. This equation, equation, life equal machine like computer is completely wrong. A living system is a system that is miraculous. No wonder why a living system is conscious. And that's why we need to study consciousness within living structures to start with. Even though I believe that all matter is conscious, but not as particles. They are the quantum fields that are conscious. In fact, electrons, protons, and so on, the particles that were considered the foundation of physics, don't even exist as objects. They're not objects. This is another bad idea that particles are particles and waves. That's what quantum physics is telling us. No, quantum field theory is telling us that particles are states of a field. And the field is everywhere. All the fields are have space and time in common. And so those are the the ontology of our world is based on fields. Consciousness is a field. Once you accept the idea that consciousness might be fundamental, primary, an irreducible property of nature, then the very nature of reality has to come into question. Because the nature of reality that physics is telling us is based on matter, inert matter without consciousness. So everything that consciousness does comes later. But if it is there from the beginning, what is it doing at the very beginning of the universe? You see, you cannot, take, and that's why this idea is so opposed by science today, because it would require revisiting all the foundational assumptions that we have about reality, about what is reality. And that's why I've been, for the last 10 years, thinking carefully about what kind of reality is this reality. And of course, we think, and we have thought until relatively recently, that this is real. That this world that we live into is real. And if it wasn't because of computers that have shown that we can build virtual realities and we can inhabit our consciousness, a piece of it can inhabit a character inside a virtual reality which exists in a computer, we would have never, never thought possible. Never thought possible that 
could be the same for this reality that we think it is the only reality. I think that for me, as I, I wrote recently my autobiography, it's called Silicon. Uh, from the invention of the microprocessor to the new science of consciousness. And in the book, I tell about my story. And in writing the book, I realized that uh, my life has been blessed, really, about, apart from the family that, that I have my wife and the kids and everything else and the success that I had and also the insuccesses that I had. But I could develop my, my head my heart and my belly. People never, seldom talk about belly, but that's where the courage is. Whereas the, the capacity to act even in defense or against, you know, worldviews and what have you. And uh, many people have head, but they don't have courage or they don't have heart. And, and so trying to optimize and bring together those three aspects is really the task of every one of us in the world in different ways, in different measures. And I feel that in my life, I have been able to, to achieve a good balance between those three. And of course, that's why I'm so interested in, in the study of consciousness, because consciousness is, brings about that capacity to or harmonize all those aspects, which are the human aspects, not the machine aspects, the human aspects of us. Okay. Have you come back online? Or? Yeah, thank you. So um can you stop your screen share? Okay. Um, Here I, I will. There you go. There you got me back there. Very good. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was so <laughs> lovely. I've seen I've seen it a couple of times and mm -hmm every time something different kind of jumps out at me and um, I was taking notes the whole time because <laughs> it's such a fascinating story, right? Um, so I want, if you have questions or anything you want um, Roberto to discuss, please go ahead and put it in the chat. But um, while people are writing their their questions or, or considering their questions, also, I want to give the, the option if you want to speak, you know, if you want to just raise your hand and ask a question. Um, we can have you unmute as well. Um, but while people are doing that, Roberto, do you want to talk to us about kind of the, the continuation of this work and what you have planned? I'd, I'd be happy to, just uh, glancing over some of the comments. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, your your embrace of that. Uh, if we can capture that somehow, Judy, I think Federico would uh, really be uh, touched by, by that. And yeah. Liz and I, who's just off camera here, um, are very touched by that. Uh, thank you all, and uh, uh, and the person who worked at Zylog, their first job. Yeah, that is it, amazing. You can still get Zylog T-shirts today, <laughs> <laughs> and the Z80 chip is still in production. Yeah, uh, That's very very good. Um, yeah, it. Uh, I, I just had the feeling this film with Federico had to be made, and um, I tend not to start to think about making film projects until they have to be made. I have to make it. Um, and this next project is that way as well. Um, was thinking and talking with people about the situation we're in in the world and how do we get here? Where did this all start uh, with human beings and consciousness? Asking the question, which is kind of the underlying thesis of the coming film, which is, uh, the film is called, uh, or will be called, uh, Frame of Mind. And it is going back to look at the history of the evolution of human awareness and how uh, migration has affected that, how uh, philosophy, uh, the humanities, um, and technology has affected that uh, right up through today and, uh, and beyond. Um, the nature of um, what our consciousness is able to do. And 
maybe to a group like this, uh, we could say that uh, we have some superpowers that could be unlocked. And maybe some of us have experienced that too. And maybe the world needs to find out more about that and the nature of unity uh, and the power of that uh, if we're going to make it as humanity on this, on this planet. So roughly speaking, that's my uh, passion uh, is to make that. And I'm excited that I made a uh, short pitch video for that, uh, showed it to a handful of people, and it got to the NEH, the National Endowment for Humanities. They invited me to apply um, for a grant, and uh, I'm in the process of that. In order to do that, I need a uh, sponsoring organization that's a nonprofit, and as coincident might have it, uh, Judy and, and Jerry and FMBR are on board to sponsor this next film, Frame of Mind. So I'm very excited to work together with you guys uh, for this in a collaborative way uh, to keep us on track. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. And it's, you know, you know, one of the things that I was in my notes, I was writing, um, uh, Federico talked about the microprocessor as, a, as an idea whose time had come. And he happened to be in the right place in the, in the right time with with the know-how, right? With with the building blocks he needed to put it together. Um, and I was, and I, I was, I've been thinking about that in the last few days about ideas whose time have, and he said, you know, it would have come without me. It would have found a way to make its way into the world. And I think um, that's when an idea, it, it, when a time has come for something, it will find its way into the world. And, um, I I love that it appears that this idea that or this awareness right of ourselves as as much bigger than the machine than a, than a machine or or what um, a materialistic science would have us believe we are um, it's 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 the idea that whose time has come and I know probably everybody listening to this um, has a sense of that as well and is and is probably actively working. To, to help change that mindset. So it's very exciting. I hope so. What you're touching on, Judy, I think is important that a lot of us uh, uh, grow up and struggle to figure out what we're meant to do in our life and try this and that, and then all of a sudden arrive at a place to where it all comes together. All of our experiences and education and, and abilities can come online. I think Federico uh, was that way. Uh, and it's just he knew this was the moment and he he stepped up to it. And I I think my own personal experience, I think Liz would agree that each of us has a calling and a uh, life agenda or a life mission. And um, I feel that in, in making the Federico film and the next one, which Federico is going to be on board for as well. That's right, because um, Becky is actually saying she wants to hear more from Federico and, and more, you know, kind of. Um, uh, expanding his ideas. And so um, that will be great. It would be great to have him featured in that as well. Yeah, he was on board. And a lot of other people are too. So, and that list is growing. Um, I'm excited about that project. Um, Becky also wanted to know if, can, can you elaborate, or I don't know if, I don't know if you have that knowledge on that pivotal experience that, that Federico had that, and, you know, he talked about, um, seeing himself as the universe ex experiencing itself this i it sounded to me like it was just a spontaneous awareness that happened do you know anything about the the conditions under which that happened i do um and i asked that question hoping he would respond but not knowing he would because he was a little cautious then about it and he is much more open about it now and has talked more about it um uh, off camera and and in some podcasts and things, but I talked to him about it directly. Uh, the conditioning was uh, he was basically unhappy. He was frustrated and trying to understand the nature of consciousness, um, the American dream, which he realized of fame, fortune, and everything else wasn't didn't make him happy. Um, so under those conditions, he was uh, up at Tahoe um, and in a hotel room and uh, got up in the middle of the night to go have a, a drink of water. And um, he, he got the water and had a drink and then like a bolt of light uh, went into him and, and through him. And he was a light and he felt a oneness with everything, a unity moment. 
And I asked Federico if that was in some way similar to what Edgar Mitchell went through on uh, his Apollo mission coming back, seeing uh, the Earth and having a moment of unity and a sense of uh, mission and calling after that and being changed by them. So he does um, speak about that. And in fact, I will look for the, the link where he answers this question directly and speaks about it. We recorded it in Italy uh, at the Pari Center in Tuscany. And I have a, in, his, in his own words uh, to to share that. Oh, that would be great. I, I love that. And I love that, um, you know, having been so successful in a very, you know, in very third dimensional Sil Silicon Valley um, business and then moving into this consciousness area um, and, and having had a spiritual awakening, there's some, at first, you know, this kind of tentativeness to share those that kind of deeper awarenesses probably for free you know I don't, I don't want to put words into his mouth but you know it's it can be a little vulnerable to do yeah. that and i was wondering i i haven't read the book silicon uh, which i am going to now um does he discuss that in the book or is did he kind of stay away from that uh he doesn't he doesn't uh, uh, that i recall uh talk about it directly about not sharing that experience uh, he's only come around to to talk about it uh, since the book has been out a little more, and um, and I could I could sense that um, he's uh, well put it put it this way uh, when we did the interview I did a rough cut uh, he was of two minds number one this tells his story his life story of um, Italy microprocessors. Uh, technology accomplishment, huge. And the last half is consciousness. And I was very clear as a, you know, uh, understanding technology here in Silicon Valley, that it's legendary what he accomplished in technology, but I want to make the sum for what he has to say about consciousness. And that really needs to be the strong focal point of this. And so we went back and forth about the balance of the story and, and things in there. And uh, and since the film has been seen and shown uh, over the last 18 months, um, everybody wants to know about consciousness. And in his next book is about irreducible, about consciousness. His book tour in Italy was, he's talking about consciousness all the time and his experience all the time now. So it's fantastic that he is uh, uh, willing to have like his response to that, that moment of unity uh, share it. So I will search for that link and, and send it over to you. Oh, fantastic. I'll send it out. I'll send it out in the newsletter as well. Um, Bruce wants to know, um, what would Federico say? Um, what would FF say how his understanding of consciousness differs from what others before him would have said consciousness is? Well, that's a good question. Um, Federico doesn't give a lot of other references to uh, other people and their work, um, uh, a whole lot, um, but he would recognize um, the uh, panpsychology of it all, how consciousness, going back to the Greeks and before, uh, saw consciousness in everything. Mm. He agrees with that. So. Um, he readily agrees that uh, this has been around for thousands of years and people through the ages have had uh, have spoken to it. So uh, even though he doesn't mention it much directly, giving other references, he is very fully aware of this. Uh, his father was very well versed in Teilhard de Jardin. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, that tells you about his upbringing as well. So... Well, that's wonderful. I um, Terre de Chardin, for people uh, don't know, is a, a Catholic mystic, we'll say, right? Yeah. Um, from the, I don't know when he lived. Was it the 1800s or earlier? Oh, no, no, I, he's uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s. 1950s, 60s. Oh, yes. His, I, I think the famous quote that Barbara Marx Hubbard used to always quote was, everything that rises converges. Yes. And yeah, Federico's was... father did it when he visited Federico a long time ago, did a painting with that exact saying. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful painting that everything that everything that ascends uh, becomes one. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that is still hanging in Federico's house. Um, so, so he's had some good influences in this regard. Um, someone wants me to type the name of the Catholic mystic. Okay. Um, T H E I T R D. S is it C H A R? If anyone knows it better than I do, I put it. Just in let me type it out here. T I L. What do you think? R D. A R D and then, you... and then space D E space C H A R D I N. Yeah. Okay. Good. Anyway, if, you know, and I love that physicists are referencing um, philosophers and mystics, right? That's this is the convergence. Right. This is that that, um, you know, there was a famous cartoon way back in, in the day where the, um, you know, the physicist is climbing the mountain, trying to find um, trying to get to the top of, of knowledge. And he gets to the top of the mountain and there's a, a guru there. Right. There's a um, this spiritual person. You have it seems like all roads lead to spirituality, right, to consciousness. Seems that way. I, I, I think so. And um, and for me, is once you're there, you carry on to a sense of unity, a mm -hmm. sense of oneness uh, to of all things. Uh, I'm still on that journey to to get there. Um, but I feel like it's in a good direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Sue wants to know, does Federico believe that consciousness is amenable to study as a scientific or mathematical discipline? Or will it always be something beyond science, a purely experiential phenomenon? Nice That's question. a really good, good question. I can tell you Federico is working with uh, an Italian physicist on the math, and uh, they are going to be jointly publishing uh, a paper on that front. So he um, he knows that math is a tool to convince other scientists about that. Uh, he's also in the process of writing two more books. Uh, one is a consciousness view of quantum biology, a quantum mechanics quantum field theory he was writing a, a really give a brief description of that the other night and it was really graspable how uh, quantum uh, physics relates to consciousness and i believe he'll have math to go with that uh, as well but he'll tell you when the book is out yeah that's and relating to experiences um um he's uh fully understands uh, that uh, is experience is so important. Um, and uh, he would have a better response to this than, than I do, uh, but how it is um, essential for uh, understanding his experience. I, I met a NASA uh, Moffett Field scientist uh, the other day, and we talked about uh, the nature of uh, empirical evidence and uh, experience. And can experience not be something that can be um, uh, a sense of proof? And uh, and he thought about that for a while and got back to me and said, absolutely, there is a movement going forward based upon experience taking into account um, of things. And of course, uh, we know from uh, observer th theory uh, in quantum uh, physics that that is experience affecting the reality of something, you know, by observing as a human being. So. Excellent, thank you. Um, Becky wants to know, did Federico talk much about how AI will change our world in so many ways and everything we do and uh, change our consciousness or consciousness, you know, sort of yeah. consciousness with a capital C? Yeah, uh, Federica would would uh, give a long and lengthy and and uh, very informative answer to that. Um, I asked him a bit about that. And we had a big long discussion. Um, I don't believe Federica is nor, nor am I uh, afraid of uh, artificial intelligence um, being confused with consciousness, um, as he says in, in this documentary. But I could tell that that question is something that must be addressed in the next film uh, series that I'm going to be creating. Front and center. It is uh, you know, four parts, four episodes in this documentary series called Frame of Mind. 
One of them is all about artificial intelligence and how it relates to consciousness. And, and the implications back and forth uh, for our physical world and, and everything else. That's wonderful. Um, I, I I was just, I'm looking back over my notes. One of the, my, one of my favorite quotes is that when he said, I have a history of being crazy, <laughs> you know, and, and I, you know, you think about, think about like, he, he talked about growing up in a place where uh, people lived like they lived 200 years ago, yeah. right? That was his starting point. And then you, you see his trajectory and um, just how the world has changed and everything like that. And, um, and he makes this point that, you know, to some people, he was always crazy, right? To, to pursue certain ideas, you know, this microprocessor idea or the artificial intelligence idea, the neural network idea. Um, um, but I, I would say he's on to something. He's got a good track record. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it, uh, you know, thinking back to my, um, uh, mercenary commercial making days, I, um, uh, I admired the uh, Apple commercials um, about here's to the crazy ones. Mm. Yeah, because they're the people who changed the world. Picasso was one of the ones that they showed. Uh, Charlie Chaplin was another one. All kinds of uh, great artists and thinkers and, and inventors. Uh, people thought they were crazy and they changed the world. Liz wants to contribute. Come on, Cameron. Speak. Well, I want to say that it has been often said that the between crazy and genius, there is a very thin line. So yes. that, that would be maybe the proof of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um Bruce, I, I want to ask Bruce Feldstein. He he put a um a link in the chat and I I can't, I didn't open it. So I just wanted if you want to raise your hand and, and say something about it, go ahead. Otherwise I will look at it later. Um let me see what other the link to uh TR Desjardins. Oh, it's to his to his work. Well, thank you for that link, Bruce. Okay, great. Um yes, okay. I was gonna say I'm really inspired by how many um uh, what seems to be as we start to put this next film together, we we're reaching out to more and more communities of uh of people who are 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 thinking along these lines there's a a vast uh call them community of consciousness or conscious com consciousness community uh about awakening and uh the awakening community is another thing it's just an enormous amount of people and it just seems like they're they're still under radar uh mm -hmm. I'd like to bring a little bit more light to some people who have some fascinating things to say and share uh, into this space. So uh, thank you, Judy, for keeping FBI, you and Jerry and everybody else, uh, keeping FBR going along and, and partnering with people like me to uh, go on this crazy adventure to uh, uh, make a, yet another series of films at, at another level too, you know, yeah. another level of production and impact and awareness and distribution and uh, getting the story out. So I'm excited about that. I was thinking about that, and, you know, this because <laughs> <laughs> this awakening community that's kind of where I, I think a lot of us hang out and you know it's just it's such it's a happy place for me to be and when he was talking about um you know consciousness as fundamental um consciousness as primary i was wondering because i i don't keep up with the with the neurological research as much because i don't i i think they're barking up the wrong tree when they're looking for consciousness in the brain and I will every once in a while, I will see an article where people are still looking for consciousness in the brain. And I think, really, um, do you know anything about the state of that research? Are people are people still doing? <laughs> oh, in, in the in the pitch video that uh, that I made um, from the conversation that I've had as well is that consciousness is not in the brain. Right. I, I joke and I say it's in the cloud. What's up with that? Yeah. Uh, but people nod and want to know more about that and uh plan to uh speak with uh, more people who are in the field of uh, neural uh biology and, and quantum biology uh to where the quantum physics happening within the brain and microtubules it seems to be that space 
if you consider that quantum physics may be that space that is part of this world and part of the other world. And that's happening in our brain as well, in kind of a uh, quantum field. Mm -hmm. There might be a way that is we're connecting to um, our consciousness, maybe higher consciousness, maybe higher self-consciousness. Uh, that is us, you know, in a that space. Right. Maybe more, more of us in that space. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think about that and, and plan to bring, plan to speak to people about that too. Uh, it seems more scientists are uh, more opening up now. I, uh, you know, Liz and I saw the play um, recently, Hair, which came out in 1969. And, and of course, the song, The Age of Aquarius, which people would say is the age of belief. And it would seem, well, it seemed like the age before us was the age of belief and the age of Aquarius is more of an age of knowing. So mm -hmm. it is a knowing um, time that we're moving into. So I think that's exciting. And knowing through experience, knowing through when you feel, you resonate with uh, others who share their experience or uh, truths that you feel, I think is an exciting time to uh, go more into that knowing space, more confidence in that space. Absolutely. And I am, uh, we talk about this, I, you know, with everyone, <laughs> with all of my friends and all the people we get together, we, we remind ourselves that, you know, um, I, I truly believe that we, we incarnated here at this time on purpose, mm -hmm. you know, to be here, to be here, to help this, this kind of transition between the ages and, um, um, it can get a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Depressing or whatever, you know, to kind of look outward at what's, at yeah. what's happening, what's yeah. collapsing and crumbling. And, but you talk about this just huge awakening community, right? There are, there are so many um, alternative technologies coming up and just um, really earth-based heart-centered um, regenerative technologies that are coming up. Um, and I think it just matters, you know, it, where you put your attention and who you're hanging out with <laughs> so that you're not in fear as things kind of start to collapse. Um, Absolutely. And I, uh, Liz and I often, when we meet somebody you know, like yourself or a handful of others, we say, you know, there's so many people in the communities that we live in that we just can't talk about these things because they're just going to start backing away. And <laughs> Slowly. Up, you know, saying, That's just too woo-woo for me. And I'm not a woo-woo guy. Uh, it's just more depth, actually, about meaning and what are we doing here? Where do we come from? Yeah. Uh, I just uh, I found the link uh, where Federico uh, recounts uh, his experience. Oh, excellent. And uh, I put that into the chat uh, so you guys can have it. Uh, please forgive my uh, crazy wild haircut uh, in the video, but that's just the wind was blowing that day in Tuscany and <laughs> all right i will send that out to everyone and liz and liz reminds me she filmed this so you can, oh, really? th you can thank liz for being on it to uh capture federico's uh, response becky says she doesn't see the link in the chat um just below my last comment it's just above your comment becky Hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Okay. So does anyone else? Oh, it's not showing up. It, well, anyway, maybe. Um, can you see I'll, it? I'll send it up. I see it. Okay. Um, I will send it, but I, I don't be able to, I, I, I can't actually um, copy it, which is interesting. Anyway. Right. Um, so if you send it to me, actually, Ooh, Roberto. Um, I think I may post the wrong link. Sorry, this is my management one let me go back and oh you know what you posted it to the host uh you can you post it to everyone yes good idea let me go back uh to that video and find the the share link and uh, i'll send it out in the newsletter as well if you if you email it to me okay that sounds good okay. figured yeah. it out um does anyone else have any questions or would anybody like to raise your hand and and have a conversation 
people are getting shyer and shyer as the world, I think. <laughs> um, but if no one has any more questions, then I think I I'm going to uh, give the link here. Um, this should be the one. And finally, to everyone, I think I thanked uh, only the host and panelists before. Uh, thank you all for your comments in here and your response to the uh, to the film. As you know, Liz and I would tell you, it's just it's heartwarming as the people appreciate and see and feel the work that you do. Uh, it makes it worthwhile to do it and to continue to uh, make films and things like this. Yeah, and Becky's saying, please, please, please continue this work. Um, and hopefully we'll get we'll get Federico in when the new book comes, you know, when when the book comes out. And um the title of the new film that you're working on is called Frame of Mind, correct? Frame of Mind. If I can type here, mind. <laughs> um, I'll uh type a link to my films page and I'll put that out there. And you can find links to the other films and uh where and more about this film particularly it's right on top uh, so put that there there we yeah. are yeah good excellent okay and i will I'll, I'll copy the chat and send it to you so you can share it with federico you'll be and, thrilled um yeah so thank you everyone thank you for joining us this yes. evening thank you all and uh thank we will you. see yeah thank you liz <laughs> Thank you, Gigi, and, and everybody. <laughs> I hope everyone has a great evening, and we will see you next time. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.